It's a good day. New scope. Yes, of course, it is a good day when you get a new telescope. What we have here is a Skywatcher 130P Heritage Virtuoso Edition. So the whole thing just flips out of the box like this. This is the telescope. This is how it comes. There are two eyepieces, 25 millimeter and 10 millimeter. They are super eyepieces, not just good, but they're super. There is a red dot reflex sight, a collimation cap, and instructions inside the box. So the way you do this is it's compact like this. The truss poles are collapsed. There is a dust cover. We'll put that aside for a second. You loosen the knob on the truss assembly, extend the truss, and you have your telescope here. It works just like any other reflector telescope. This has a mirror, a five inch mirror in the back, which gathers light, sends the light into this diagonal mirror, which deflects the light into the focuser. This is the eyepiece here. This is where you look. To change magnifications, you change eyepieces. It works on a Dobsonian mount. That's a fancy word that means that it goes up and down and left and right. Named after San Francisco astronomer John Dobson, credited for popularizing its design. Okay, so I've recommended the Heritage 130P and the Heritage 150P for many amateurs for many years now. The 130P has been known as the AWB-1 Sky and may be known by other names as well, depending on where in the world you happen to live. The Heritage 150P, that's the six inch version of this, has been reviewed on this channel before. I'll put a link in the description in case you wanna look at it. But what sets this version apart, this Virtuoso variant, is that it has a go-to mount in its base. Now, if you're not familiar with the concept, a go-to mount has a computer and motors inside the base. So by pointing the telescope at one or two or three or more bright objects in the sky, depending on which system you happen to be operating, it will then build an internal model of the sky and it knows where it is. And by using a controller of some kind, you can get the telescope to move to any object in the sky that you want it to. So the price has gone up, of course. Prices are in flux right now, but the standard five inch and six inch versions are a little less than $300 US and a little more than $300 US, depending on where you look. These virtuoso go-to editions are 435 at the time of filming for this smaller five inch version and for $70 US for the six inch version. Interesting to note, there isn't a lot of price difference between the five and six inch versions. So one question I'm getting already on this is, if I have this Virtuoso, if I have the go-to version, can I use it manually? In other words, can I just push it around? And the answer is, yes, you can. You don't have to turn on the computer if you don't want to. There are these clutch knobs on this side here. There's one on this axis, and there's one on this axis, a little bit hard to see here, but you can just move this around and look as if it were a standard Heritage 130P. So with a telescope like this, you can see lots of things. The phases on the moon, Jupiter, the largest planet with the great red spot, two cloud belts at least, and its four largest moons, and the rings of Saturn are also not a problem. As well as deep sky objects, there are dozens if not hundreds of those that you can see depending on how diligent you are and how good your skies are. These bright deep sky objects include the Orion Nebula, the Pleiades, the Andromeda Galaxy, and many more. So the two eyepieces here are 25 millimeter and 10 millimeter eyepieces yielding about 26 power and 65 power respectively. Hopefully you've seen enough of my videos by now to know to stay at the low power eyepiece for most of your viewing. The eyepieces are inch and a quarter standard diameter. This dovetail that the red dot reflex sight sits on is also somewhat of an industry standard. Many other red dot reflex sights will fit on there including the Orion Easy Finder series. Also, the dovetail plate here, this green thing here, is a Vixen-compatible dovetail plate in case you want to swap things around. Little things like that are appreciated. So if you're familiar with the standard Heritage 130P, this telescope looks very similar except that you have this additional module here containing the electronics, the computers, and the motors. So it does work off of eight AA cells. There's a little battery pack here or you can power it with a 12 volt DC input here. There's a receptacle here for a hand controller, which I don't have here, or if you don't have that, you can operate it with your phone. There's an app that you download and you can do everything from your phone wirelessly. You can initialize the telescope and use the go-to function right from here. I do suspect as time goes on, this is going to get more popular 
phone telescope integration appears to be an upcoming thing. Okay, so this sample was provided to me by Skywatcher. As of the present time in filming, it is very hard to get new telescopes right now. They're just not available. So I've been getting asked a lot about this model, and when I was approached to have them send me one of these, I said, sure, let's do that. I'm curious about this thing myself. Okay, so if you remember the review of the Skywatcher 150 Heritage P, that's the six inch manual version of this, I said that the main thing you wanna be worried about is that it has to be on something steady. And that's true here, but even more so, because I think a lot of beginners aren't aware of this. They're not aware of just how steady this telescope has to be once it's initialized. A lot of things that you might think might be steady enough aren't. I mean, this thing has wheels on it, which is not ideal. I'm actually thinking about getting rid of the wheels, but if you have the calibration all set on this two-star alignment, say, and you just do like that, I mean, you're done. You have to start everything all over again. It has to be absolutely rock steady. I've had people say, well, just use the carton that it came in and set it on top. That's not steady enough. I've had people say, turn a five gallon bucket over and set it on that. I don't think that's gonna work either. I've had people say, use a card table. Yeah, maybe, but the problem is a card table is wide and you're gonna be leaning in to look at the eyepiece. In the dark, it's easy to bump the thing. You bump it and you've gotta start all over again. Likewise, the hood of a car is not a good idea because you need 360 degree access around the telescope. You don't know where the eyepiece is going to be. Hoods of cars are also sloped and it has to be flat. So I have this table here. It's not ideal, but I can get it to work. I have had people say that there is an end table by IKEA that works. If you know that model number, somebody put that in the comments below. If you've never seen an alignment before, I'll show you some basics here, and we're gonna run into what I feel is probably the biggest complaint I have about this thing, the manual. So the manual for the telescope itself is fine. There are lots of drawings and diagrams. You could show you what it is you're supposed to be doing. The instructions for the SynScan app, it's a download, and I get that. There are frequent updates and you need to be able to change those things. I don't mind having a downloaded manual, but if you look at the manual itself, <laughs> there's a lot of text and there's a lot of tables. There isn't one screenshot of what happens when you actually look at the app. So it's possible that you could read the entire SynScan manual and then be completely flummoxed when you actually open up the app. There need to be some screenshots of what the phone looks like and I wouldn't mind a quick start guide as well. Well, okay. so. Here's how this works. You can turn, here, let's go ahead and turn this around. But you turn it on, and by the way, this continues Skywatcher's fascination with really tiny power switches. Look at how little that thing is. And once you log into the device, which I'm gonna do right now, you can start the SynScan app, and you get this screen here, which tells you what to do. Now, we're outside, we're doing a dummy align, it is, white and if it's dark out, if you're doing this at night, it's gonna be red to preserve your night vision. Again, if you've done this before, like I've done a lot of these, you kinda of know what to do, but if you're a beginner, you could be really stymied as to what you're supposed to do next. What you're supposed to do first is to tap the alignment key here, and there are a number of different alignment options that it shows you. Hopefully you know by now, don't use the one star alignment. It isn't accurate enough, it doesn't give enough data points, and doesn't build an accurate enough model of the night sky. I found the two star north level alignment to be adequate for most low power applications. Let's go ahead and do that. Now you're gonna choose two stars to go from, and I'm just gonna go, go ahead and arbitrarily choose uh, Capella and Procyon. It will then move to Capella. Now, if you'll notice here, we are doing this here in the daytime. I have put this lens cap on here for safety reasons. We don't want it to go anywhere near the sun. So another thing to notice is that depending on the accuracy of your north level alignment, the first star is not going to be in the finder or in the eyepiece. It's going to be off by a little bit to a lot, in which case you're going to be tapping these arrow keys to get it centered. And then when you're done, there's this one or two arrow keys that is in red. You do that to take away the backlash. That's a nice little feature here. And I hit a line and now it's gonna to go to the second star, which is Procyon. Now, when it gets to the second star, it should be closer. The alignment should be better. 
If it's worse, you probably did something wrong. You might want to scrap it and start all over again. And we are good. We're ready to go. We are aligned. So in this case, we have the second screen here, which is what do you want to look at? So let's tap the deep sky key and it's already defaults to Messier. Let's go to a cluster called M38 and hit go to, and it goes there by itself. Now, I've done this many, many times with the two star north alignment. It's pretty good with the low power eyepiece operating at 26 power. It does put the object in the field of view every single time. Now, if you go to the higher power eyepiece, the 10 millimeter, maybe not so much. I would stay with the low power eyepiece. Hopefully you've seen enough of these videos right now to know to do that. Okay, so a couple of other considerations here. You'll see that this is an open truss assembly here. The secondary mirror is exposed. You are going to be susceptible to both dew and glare. I had a humid night here once and the secondary dewed over within about 10 minutes. I was done for the evening. Perhaps more annoying is the glare issue. Any kind of light coming around here whatsoever, you know, a passing car or even the glow from the app will be enough to send light into the secondary and just kind of blow out whatever it is that you're doing. So I made this thing. It's not very good. It's just a piece of construction paper here and you don't need much. And I would just do this and you wrap it, oops, you wrap it around like this and I just tape it here. There's a cutout here for where the eyepiece goes. That's enough to cut out the glare. So the second thing is, and this is something that's a function of the app itself. If you have a traditional wired controller like this one, the up, down, left, right keys are raised buttons and this one's even beveled on this AVX controller. You can be looking through the eyepiece and using the keypad at the same time because you can feel where the buttons are. On the phone, you can't feel where the buttons are and this can be a problem because you have to look through the eyepiece and you can't be looking at the keypad at the same time. So you're gonna be looking at the eyepiece, looking at the phone, looking at the eyepiece, looking at the phone. It takes a little while for you to get good at this. Another thing that beginners need to know is, you know, I've done a lot of these and I was able to figure out exactly what goes where, but if you're a beginner, don't count on getting the alignment right the first time. And probably you're not gonna get it right the second or third time either. And in fact, I'll just tell you, there are these two little arrows to the left and the right of the keypad itself. Those are the slew rate buttons. In other words, it goes from one to nine and you can raise the or lower the rate that these keypad, that the keypad moves the telescope, nine is the highest. There is a number in the middle of the keypad that tells you which rate you're currently selected at. Now, if you've initialized a bunch of these before, that's kind of a standard in the industry, but again, if you're a beginner, you might find that kind of baffling. And again, all of this is in the manual, but it's buried in text and it's easy to miss. Well, okay, let's say you're an advanced user and you wanna try some other stuff out. Well, this telescope is mounted on this green thing. This is a Vixen compatible dovetail rail. It is an industry standard and most mounts will accept this thing. So you could, if you wanted to, remove the optical tube here and stick it on an equatorial mount of your own choosing. This is my Celestron AVX, which is a better mount. It's a stronger mount, it's more accurate, and best of all, perhaps, you don't have to set it on anything. But I will suspect that people who do want to play with this are going to be doing the opposite. I've seen people buy this telescope just to get the mount. They don't really care about the optical tube. You can mix and match. Some telescopes I've tried here include the Astrotech AT72, the Orion Short Tube 80, and the Celestron C5. And among these, I had the Orion Short Tube 80 on here and it worked quite well. So on here, you can see the mount does not know or care what's on it. So I do wanna point out a couple of things real quick. There's a couple of caveats you need to learn. Number one, no matter what you put in here, you have to make sure that at the zenith, whatever you're putting on here does not run into the base. This happens because I've seen people put a long refractor on here because it looks fine here, but then if the mount tries to do this, it's gonna run into the base and you're gonna risk burning out the motors. The second thing is try to keep the focal length reasonable. Don't go crazy. <laughs> Be reasonable about all of this. This has a focal length of 400. That one has a focal length of 520. By the time I got to the C5, I also tried to meet ETX at the 90 millimeter Maxitov. At 1250 millimeters, the accuracy of the mount is going to appear to go down. 
So even after dropping the power all the way down with the 32 millimeter Plossel on the Mi DTX, it wasn't quite accurate enough all the time. So again, don't go crazy, keep the magnification down. Okay, so the other advanced thing you can try is some very basic, and I want to put the stress on the word basic, astrophotography. The manual does have a section on astrophotography. I've got some conflicted feelings about that. You're not going to be doing any serious astrophotography with this telescope. It's a basic scope, and you're going to be running into some frustrations right away. But you can if you want to. I have this webcam planetary imager. The eyepiece comes out like this, and you can put this in here and try some basic imaging. Now, I do want to stress this was not easy, nor was it fun. On the stock base mount, it wasn't all that great. I had a much better luck doing it on this thing because the mount is a lot more steady and the backlash and all of this is a lot better. The other thing you're going to want to do is make sure that if you're going to try this, this is the only camera that I know that's like this, that's an inch and a quarter all the way around, all the way down, because you're going to have to put this all the way into the focuser to reach focus. This is the ZWO ASI 120mm Mini, and even ASI's larger cameras have a flange on them that prevents them from getting you in there. It's another reason why astrophotography is probably not going to work. Your DSLR will, cannot go in far enough to reach focus. But I did manage to get this image of the moon. It's not half bad. Okay, so with the app, I haven't even scratched the surface of all of the features available in it. I'll let you discover that by yourself. So. Any complaints about this thing? Well, they're fairly minor. Number one, some people do not like helical focusers. I get that, but this was done, I'm sure, in the name of cost and of weight. Also, the lens cap here was awfully loose. I had to shore it up with some sticky backed felt. Loose dust caps seem to be a thing in our industry right now, and uh, hey, I've just modified a review sample. Oh no, does this mean I'm on the hook financially for this thing? Also, the 10 millimeter eyepiece is adequate. I didn't think it was all that comfortable. It is labeled long eye relief. I'm not sure how they're defining long eye relief. I felt I had to put my face on my eye, almost right on the eyepiece itself to see the entire field of view. Other than that, it's a pretty basic telescope, so don't expect miracles out of it. And again, find something sturdy to set it on. Be patient with the electronics. Be reasonable with the magnification, and I would forget all about the astrophotography. Other than that, I think this is a pretty good telescope for beginners. You can have a lot of fun with this, and it can teach you a lot. It may also be suitable for people looking for a second or third telescope, or for filling in gaps or niches in larger collections. And finally, as this is a new model, this is the only one of these I've ever seen. So if any of you have one of these in your collection, please let us know how yours is in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.